name that we do pray. Amen. The late uh, President Halvin Coolidge returned home from attending church early one Sunday afternoon. His wife had been unable to attend, but she was interested in hear what the minister spoke in the service. Coolidge responded, sin. She pressed him for a few words of explanation. And being a man of few words with his wife, he responded, well, I think he was against it. <laughs> well, I think that is a fair summarization of Paul's treatment of sin in Romans 7. I think he is against it. But it really does require more explanation than that, doesn't it? See, we need an explanation of the human condition. Why is it that we're the kind of beings that can attain to such greatness and beauty? The fact that we can accomplish so much good, and yet on the other hand, perform such evil and participate in degradation. When you think about those that we might observe as being the most evil people, killing people, cutting off heads, and the fact that in another part of their lives they may be merciful, they may be giving, they may be generous, they're a kind father. How, how is that possible? Well, I think that conundrum that faces all of us in terms of our human nature is exactly the thing that Paul explains in Romans 7. I mean, oftentimes those things are coming from the same person. And again, that's what Paul is explaining here. It really is a gut-wrenching passage where Paul bears his soul, revealing something about himself in terms of what he's struggling with. But this causes all of us to breathe a sigh of relief because we understand we are the same way. So no, you're not crazy. No, there's not necessarily voices in your head. But we do have to understand just what is going on. So we can turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. And we'll start in verse 7 and just review what we've covered here. Because 7 through 25 really is a package in terms of the argument that Paul is making. Um, but basically when it comes to Romans 7, 7 through uh, 12... Uh, or even the rest of the passage, Paul has shared what the, what the law can't do before these verses, and now he's going to share what the law is meant to do. What is the law for? And so basically what we see in Romans 7, and they'll get this up as soon as they can, uh, what we see in Romans 7 is that the law, I'm sorry, 7-7, seven, seven, is the law reveals sin. So it says here in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not, indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. And so again, verse 7, the law reveals sin. That's one of its primary purposes. In fact, the, the book of Galatians actually describes the law as a school teacher training us and revealing the fact that we can't accomplish righteousness, we can't be as good as God would ask us to be, but, uh, but in terms of just what it does in terms of our sin nature, it reveals sin. And then beyond that, in verse 8, we see that it arouses sin. And again, we covered this last week, so I'm going through it quickly, but it said, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire, for apart from the law, sin is dead. So not only revealing sin, not does it just provide a rule that says this is right and this is wrong, but once faced with a rule, who of us doesn't know the tendency to break it? And in the opposite, and in the absence of the law, we might not even think about it. You might not even think, don't touch the wet paint as you're walking by. But once you say, don't touch it, I'm not sure if you're the kind of person that would be tempted to touch it just because the law is there. That's just the tendency we have as human beings. 9 and 10, then, it does, it does require a little more explanation in terms of what we have here. It says, once I was alive apart from the law, but when the, life, when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that it was intended to bring life actually brought death. And so verses 9 and 10 show us that sin produces death. And when it uses that word death, what it means primarily is that it means separation from God. That ultimately sin cannot be in God's presence. That he is so righteous, he is so holy, that he can't accept anything in his presence that's not about his righteousness. So when we think about our sinful condition, our sinful behavior, our sinful intentions, 
Again, that separates us from God. And that, that is the primary way that the Bible is communicating, that that is death. What is death that, that comes from sin? It's separation from God. In fact, when you think about the garden, you think about you know, Adam and Eve, and when uh, God said, you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. What we might expect, and they might have even expected, that the minute they ate the fruit, they would fall to death. They would die physically, but they didn't. But what happened? They were separated from God. They were kicked out of the garden in terms of the fellowship and relationship with Him. So that's the primary thing it means when it says that sin produces death. Death is also another expression of that, or another way that it causes death, is it causes destruction in our souls and in our bodies. That basically the reason why God is so opposed to sin is because of its destructive nature. The fact that he never intended our souls and our bodies to live in independence from him. So the minute we do something that's outside of his plan, we're actually contributing to a process of death in our own life and destruction in terms of what, what, in, what our bodies and our souls are, are, are exposed to that is contrary to the way that God intended so it's separation from God in terms of what this death means, causing destruction in our soul and body, um, and towards others. It also uh, de destroys other people, too. It destroys relationships. You know, when you think of many of the sins that are self-centered, you think about the destructive patterns in terms of how our lives affect other people. I think that's another part of the death that happens. See, not only separation from God... Separation from ourselves and what God would intend for us to be, and separation between one another is what death causes, and then it will eventually lead to physical death. So, when the Bible says that sin produces death, that's what it's talking about. To me, those four dynamics. But the key thing about verse 11 is that sin deceives us with, what well, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't move to verse 11. I should move to my notes. I apologize for that. But basically what, what Paul is saying in 9 and 10, in terms of the Lord producing death, when it says here in verse 10, I found that the very commandment that, will, was, intended, that was intended to bring life actually brought death. Let me read that again. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. The only reason why the law brings that death is because it's dependent on the sin nature. That basically the law is pre presented in the environment of the sin nature, so therefore because the sin nature is producing death, and the law exposes that sin nature, it, it, it arouses that sin nature, that's why the law brings death. But it's actually sin that's producing death, but because the law is dependent, or, or, or even better to say it's, it's, it's brought in the environment of sin, it, it produces death. So it's not really the law that's producing the death, but rather it's a, rather it's a sin nature that, that, that is using law for that purpose. And we're going to get that get, when we get to verse 12 in terms of what Paul says about the law. But then sin deceives us in verse 11 in terms of what Paul is saying here. For sin sees the opportunity afforded by the command, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. And so that, again... Paul is talking, again, the whole point of this passage is, what is, what is the law meant to do? Well, what does the law produce in our lives? It, it exposes sin, it arouses sin, it produces death. But it produces death because it depended on sin. And what sin actually does is it uses the law to deceive us. I mean, think about that initial interaction, again, in the garden. What did Satan say to Eve? Did God really say? See, he used the command against Eve and against God. He said the very thing that, that God said and said, I'm going to twist this. I'm going to pervert this. Did God really say that? Did he really mean that? Is that really going to happen? And basically using the opportunity of deception that was in the commandment itself, again, that's another destructive part of the law. Well, why the law is, is, is more a destructive element in our life rather than something that's constructive. And that's Paul's point, is that the law could never produce righteousness, but not only that, it, it, it is more involved in the sin in our life than in the righteousness that, that God would seek to pro, uh, promote 
or encourage in our lives. So again, that's the point that he's making in terms of how the law re re relates to sin. But, well, I'm going to keep on going forward when I should have to finish the slides. Um, that sin deceives us with regard to the satisfaction we get from it, the excuses we have for it, and the probability of, us, of avoiding the consequences. We saw this last week. Uh, but again, just, just let that, just pass your eyes and ears again in terms of just the nature of that deception. That, they, you know, when you think about how sin engages your heart, when I think about how sin engages my heart in terms of the temptation that it brings, oftentimes, again, sin deceiving us, again, taking the very command, taking the things of God and perverting them and then changing them and, and deceiving us through that, Oftentimes, it is along the line of what excuses I have for it. Again, what, what reasons, like God has all his reasons why he would promote righteousness. God has all his reasons why he would lead us towards good. But then what, Paul, what, what the sin often does is gives us excuses for it. That here's the reasons why you should do it. Here's the way, reasons why you should follow my command. Even thinking again about Eve. What does he say? God is keeping something from you. What, what's a great reason for you to eat the fruit? Is you'll be wise. How's that for an excuse? I've got good things for you. How, how, how's that for an excuse? And then the, um, you know, the satisfaction we get from the excuse that we have for it and the probability of avoiding the consequences. You're not going to die. This isn't going to destroy you. He's got not going to know. She's not going to know. You're, 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 you're in the dark. You're in, the, you're in private. No, nothing's going to hurt anyone. All the things that sin comes in and deceives us in terms of generating its life, or really its death, its power, its influence in us, but the sin nature's power and influence promotes death in us. And again, because it's using the law, because the law... It inspires the sin nature. That's why the law produces death. See, the whole point that Paul is making here is that when we think about the life of God, the law can never produce the life of God in us because it's, it's fatally flawed by virtue of the fact that it is dependent on the sin nature. But in spite of all that, in spite of all the things that, said, that Paul has said about the law... He then says in verse 12 this, So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. I mean, all the things that Paul has said about the law that's negative, can't get us to God, can't produce the Christian life in us, it arouses sin, it reveals sin, sin uses it in terms of deceiving us and manipulating it, so again, we follow its way rather than God's way. But in spite of all that, the reality is, the law is holy, righteous, and good. And what do those words mean when we talk about the law being holy? It is set apart. It is distinct. It is of God. I and mean, when you see that word holy, that's what it means. So, so if, if you, you've been looking about where's the source of the law, whose idea was it of the law? It was, it's of God. Who, who else is holy in terms of the way that God is holy? And again, that's what, that's what that holiness uh, points to in terms of just what the law is. It's also righteous. That word righteous points to the fact that it is true. It is valid. It is correct. It is straight. If you, if you were looking at, again, the, the, the best way to do something, the right way to accomplish something, that's what the law provides. So it is holy, it is righteous, and it is good. It's good in the sense that it's helpful. It brings good results. It, it produces a desirable effect. And so again, in spite of how the sin nature uses the law, what Paul is saying is that the law is still good. But then what's the problem then? In other words, if the law is good, if you would say that the law is holy, righteous, and good, why are you so opposed to it, Paul? I mean, that would be the argument, right? That would be, the detractor would say, but all along, really through the first seven chapters, Paul, You've been blasting the law about all it can accomplish and all it can't do. And then in addition to that, it, it, it actually is almost like the compatriot of sin. It, it helps sin. It arouses sin. It deceives. Sin deceives me through the 
you say is, is negative, but now it's holy, righteous, and good. What's the problem? Why should we just follow the law? And that's what he says in verse 13. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means, but in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me, that, that through, through death in me, through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Let me read that again. Did that which, which is good then become death to me? By no means, but in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. And so again, another purpose of the law, and another problem with the law, again, the answer that Paul would give towards those who would say, how can you say the law is holy, righteous, and good, and is also on the side of sin? How can you say both of those, Paul? And he would say the law is fatally flawed due to it being placed in the environment of the sin nature. And so, so, so basically, when, when, when you, again, someone outside of Christ and outside of the power of God, you give him a standard to live by. You give him the righteous law. You give him the standards that God would affirm and God would desire in terms of his life, and he can't do it. That ultimately it will not produce the life that God would intend because it's fatally flawed that it's in the environment of the sin nature. Like the only thing in terms of power and influence that we have to offer that law outside of Christ is our sin nature, and our sin nature can't do it. See, that's why the law produces death, because the sin nature produces death, and the law uh, inspires that sin nature. But here, also in verse 13, the law becomes a double agent because it exposes sin to be really bad. See, so when we take, when again, we think about the law and we think about the destructive things that Paul has said, how it is said that it's on the side of sin. It is helping sin operate in your life because that's the way the sin, that's the way sin engages with the law. So even though the law is righteous and good, it's inspiring the sin nature. But now, the double agent feature of the law in terms of God's purposes for us, is that now when the sin nature that's evil takes what is ultimately good and produces evil from that, it shows itself to be utterly evil. And that's again Paul's point in verse 13. You know, and let me explain it this way. That you know something, when evil things happen to evil people, we, we, we can understand that. You know, you're a drug dealer, and you get shot by another drug dealer. You know, we might you know, call that tragic and we might you know, mourn in terms of you know, what that is. But we also might say to ourselves, you know something, you kind of had it coming. That again, you expose yourself to an, an evil environment. So if evil happens to you, well now I can explain that. But then it, all of a sudden, if an innocent child gets killed in a drive-by shooting, that's more tragic, right? Like when good people suffer because of evil people, that's even more rotten, right? You know, we were driving down Route 102 yesterday on our way to get a Christmas tree. But anyways, um, and we passed by a Habitat for Humanity house on 102. And Karen points out, again, yeah, that's the place where they robbed the shed and stole all the tools and all the equipment they had for the job. It's like, how, how rotten is that? Like of all the places to rob, you're going to rob a habitat for you. Good people trying to do a good thing for, for, for needy people and people that need help. Again, that's even more evil. See, so when you take a good thing and you produce evil from it, that's even more rotten, right? And that's what Paul is saying in verse 13. That God's intent for the law is good. He's trying to bless us. He's trying to show us the way we should live. Now the sin nature comes in and corrupts that. It uses it for its own ends. It, it arouses sin and it establishes sin. It reveals sin in terms of its nature and its purposes for our life. Well, when the sin nature does that, it shows itself to be even worse than it is. I mean, have you ever been shocked by your evil? Have you, have you ever been shocked by how low you could go? 
Or maybe, let's, let's, let's not speak so personally, can, can you, have you ever been shocked by how low other people go? You know, that friend of yours, you know, that went this low or did this thing? You know, that's what Paul is saying, that there is sometimes that what we do, what we think, what we could concoct in our mind is so bad, when we know in the presence what the right is, we know what the right thing that's doing, but every compulsion in our heart is, I want to do the evil, I want to do the... See, that, that actually makes it more evil. Because when you produce evil in the presence of something that's good, like when you, when you read a, much of the law in terms of what God is communicating, in terms of relationships with people and protection for those that are could be victimized or could be, be uh, used in terms of their life and their situation in, 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 in life, we would see that it's good, that, that we should attain to those standards in terms of what the law presents. But when the law is given in the environment of the sin nature, the sin nature corrupts that. And, but, by, but by so doing, even though Paul has said the law... See, there's two, things that, there's two things that Paul has to do here in terms of what he's presenting, in terms of his case about the evil nature of sin. He has to, exp he has to express its source of power. He has to express why it is that we struggle so much with it in terms of what invigorates it in our lives. So he, in terms of communicating the, the new way of the Spirit and the new way that God would empower us and transform our lives... He has to discredit the law, because the law is not the means to accomplish the Christian life. But he doesn't want to discredit the law too much, because ultimately the law is holy, righteous, and good, and is of God. And so what is corrupting about the law is the sin nature, and the, the environment of the sin nature that is, that is, that is uh, put in. And so then the sin uses that for the sake of death and destruction in terms of our lives. But part of what is intended in this is to show us how utterly evil we are. And that's, that's, what, that's what the law does. That, that's what it reveals about us. Moving on into verse 14. We know the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do not... But if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it but it is sin living in me that does it. And so first working through verses 14 through 16, I mean, who of us doesn't understand what Paul is saying here? When you think about your best intent, what you ultimately know to be good, and in spite of what you know to be good, you do the evil. And even knowing that the evil is bad, that you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't say that, you shouldn't go there, and what happens? You go there, right? Can I get an amen? amen. Uh, I'm getting some knowledge of heaven. Like, we all get this, right? Like, I'm not the only one, right? I'm not the only one. Just, I, I say, amen, Paul. Like, thank you that I'm not alone. Thank you that you're telling me what I've known all my life, that I might want to do good, but you know something going to hit my sister. You know, I know it's not right to do that. I'm not, I know it's not right to break my mother's toy, but you know something? I'm, the right, the good is there. I know what the right thing to do is, but boom, this is what I'm going to do. But again, that goes from childhood wrong, to teenage wrong, to adult wrong, to old age wrong, to we never go beyond that. Where we have this desire to do what's good, but rather than doing the good we know we should do, we do the evil. You get that? You understand that? That that so Paul, I mean, for, for Paul to explain that, again, isn't it a sigh of relief to say, you know, if someone understands me, um, someone understands the voices I hear in my head and all the dynamics of evil that are participating there, 
But again, he has to, in, in, in exposing that, he has to explain, like, how is the law operating in that? Again, it's not really being helpful, but it's also not completely counterproductive. Because if it is the standard of good, and it gives me a standard to realize when I'm doing wrong, then that's a good thing. And when I can be wrong in the presence of something that's good, like I know the good standard, I know what it is, I know why it is, but I don't know how it is. I don't know how to do it. And that's the problem that Paul is saying, that in spite of having the knowledge of what it is, knowing what I should do, why I should do it, I just don't do it. And, and, and so therefore, we have to understand, what, like, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for the law? Is the law a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's really both. It's doing good things in you, but it can't accomplish ultimate things. It can't accomplish the purpose of God. But, God, but Paul has to explain that and explain in the conundrum of the human spirit and, and, and what we deal with in our lives. And so the conundrum of the human condition... Uh, and that's what Paul is explaining here, the conundrum of the human condition. And thank God Paul lets us know that we're not alone. See, because before we solve the problem, we have to know what the problem is. Uh, Paul here diagnoses the problem. I mean, isn't that true? That, that, in, that in order for us to understand what our problem is, Paul has to tell us what it is. And that's what he's doing here in Romans 7. And again, it's gut-wrenching. Paul is exposing himself. You know something? You think I'm the holy and righteous apostle? I'm living for Jesus. I'm sacrificing myself, sharing the gospel around the world. Yeah, guess what? When it comes down to brass tacks, sometimes I want to do what's good, and I do the evil. And I know the evil, and I know it's not good, and that's the very thing I do. And so again, he's, he's exposing himself because he's exposing us into the, in terms of the reality of our lives. Now what happens in verse 17 is very interesting in terms of what Paul communicates here. And let's bring up that slide in terms of verse 17. See, it's important for Paul and us to distinguish ourselves from sin, but not absolve ourselves of responsibility for it. That basically when he says in verse 17, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. On some level, Paul is distinguishing ourselves from the sin we commit. That, that basically, as, I, as that process is going, as again, I know what's good, but I do the evil. I know it's evil, and I do it anyways. What's going on in that? It's in terms of what's creating that, who's responsible for that, why is that happening? He has to identify the fact that sin is the, is the source of that. Sin is the thing that's encouraging that in our life. And so on some level, I'm not the one that's doing it, sin is doing that. So he has to distinguish ourselves from the sin that is, that is um, fostering that tendency in our life. Basically, Paul is recognizing here, I have to read this, anyways, you can't see because it's like, Paul is recognizing here the objective, neutral part of us that is neither good or bad, but is the part that chooses what nature and kingdom to be controlled by. See, and this is the bottom line in terms of victory, in terms of what is truly at issue. See, because our tendency is to think of our decisions being about particular sins. Don't lie, don't steal, don't murder, don't lust, don't gossip. We always think in terms of particular sins that we're not doing. And what Paul is saying is you really have to think about the nature that is, that is, is empowering you, the nature that is controlling you in terms of what you're doing. And so Paul, again, is recognizing this objective, neutral part of us that is just doing the choosing. See, because, let me read what I have here. See, if I was sin, if I and sin were the same, that there would be no independent part of the self to choose Christ and be saved and transformed by the Spirit. See, if, see the important thing that Paul's saying is that it's sin that is doing this. It's really, I'm choosing to let sin control me, 
So I can't absolve myself of the responsibility for it. I'm still the one choosing to let that nature control me, but it's still that nature producing it. See, because if I wasn't distinct from sin, then I couldn't choose the path to avoid it. I could not choose the path to overcome it. I could not choose Christ. So that's why I think it's important for us to understand, as all these dynamics are happening in our life, the sin nature is operating, it's trying to tempt us and lead us astray. It's using the law to expose itself and to empower itself and corrupt itself. But then, on the other hand, the law is showing how evil sin is by how good it is and it corrupts it in spite of what, what it would, this law would intend to produce. But as all those dynamics are happening, Paul has to understand that there's an objective part of ourselves choosing. And it's choosing what nature is going to control me. What am I going to be occupied with? What am I going to be empowered by? What am I going to be influenced by? And, it's, it's, and that's what he points to in verse 17. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. That's the dynamic of the sin nature. Again, having the law, but, to, but to defying it in terms of what it produces in my life. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This is what I can keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So basically, Paul understands that this principle is so important, he repeats it twice. Now, in, in no way, again, does this absolve us from responsibility. See, this is not a dichotomy that Paul is presenting in terms of there's a righteous part of you and there's an evil part of you and not, nor the twain should meet. Or just let that sin nature do what it wants because that's all that sin nature does so just continue to be evil and don't worry about that. Just, just keep fostering the good. Paul does not create that dichotomy. But he does need to explain again why it is that we can be so righteous that we can be so good and yet be corrupted at the, same, at, at the same time. And so what explains that is because you've got a sin nature in you that can only think about sin. And there's nothing good in that. And so the minute we, you, us, allow that sin nature to empower us, that produces death in us. It corrupts the law that is good and uses it for its devices. But now we're in the middle, in terms of outside of Christ, trying to figure this all out and trying to work with this law that can't work, this sin nature that's deceiving, corrupting me. I'm doing things evil that I really don't even want to do. The good I want to do, I can't even do. And so therefore, what Paul is expressing is the conundrum, the frustration, the disappointment of the human condition. That ultimately, there's nothing I can do for myself. Knowledge cannot save me. I can't know enough to solve my problems, to fix my issues, to overcome sin. My will is not enough. I can't garner up enough choice to say, I'm going to do good and I'm going to defeat this sin nature. I'm going to put it down in terms of its destructive nature. Diagnosis can't do it in terms of you. I know exactly what's going on. I know what's happening. See, we need a power outside of ourselves to solve the problem. And that's why I really had to get to verses 21 through 25, because that's the answer. See, I find this law at work, when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Let me just break there. I mean, have you ever experienced that? Even when you're doing good, evil is right there? How many people can testify? You go to pray and you think wrong thoughts. How many people testify? You go to read the word, you go to minister. What? Like, how can I be thinking that when I'm trying to pray to God? Welcome to the human condition, Paul would say. How have, and then, but then for, for, for my inner being, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, and work within my members. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that I myself... So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. But the bottom line, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death. See, that is the cry of the human spirit. That is the cry of the human condition. 
That is the frustration, the disappointment, the desperation that comes when you try to fix yourself. When you try to answer your own answers and come up with your own solution. You can't do it because any law you would give yourself is flawed by the fact that you have no power to perform it. And if I've confused you up to this point, that's the bottom line. That the minute you give yourself a law, you have no power. That the only thing that that law does is arouse that corrupting influence. And so I'm a wretched man. Because even when it comes to things I would want to do, all the th things I wouldn't want to do, I can't even do that. I might do it with some consistency, with a little bit of effort. But in terms of totality, in terms of completeness, no, we are all wretched people. But God was not content to leave us in that state. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is, we again cry out with Paul and say, yes, Paul, I agree. I am wretched. I can't do it. I'm confused. I don't, I don't even understand what I do. But I do understand Jesus. I do understand sacrifice. I do understand forgiveness. I do understand love in terms of all that I need in terms of my life and all that I'm lacking. I loved the song we sang, All That I Am For All That You Are. Amen. I'll give you all this stuff, all the wretchedness of who I am, and exchange it.